Hello, I'm Katie and thank you for joining me for Art Snaps, which explores and celebrates artworks from Swindon's collection of modern British art. Over the past six episodes, we've looked at a number of works from Swindon's collection which have been loosely grouped in a variety of ways, such as what exhibition they're in at the moment, or a particular mood or character they have in common. And for this episode, I thought it was about time that we got a few different voices involved in the podcast. So I put a call out to members of staff at Swindon Museum and Art Gallery, which asked them what they wanted me to talk about in an art snap. And this could either be a favourite artwork or something they're curious about and want to explore a little bit further. And I was thrilled to get plenty of emails back with a truly eclectic group of suggestions, which really reflects what I love about art, that the experience is often subjective and what one person feels that they can connect with can often be so different from what another person feels they can connect with. So today I'm going to look at each of the suggestions that I got back, which means that this episode is going to deviate slightly from its usual format of describing three artworks. And we're going to actually look at each of the six works put forward by members of my team. And I'd like to go from newest to oldest. So first, let's look at Cat People Collage number four by Monster Chetwind, which was put forward by our management support officer, Tracy, who loves it because she feels it's subversive, imaginative, creative and silly. And I'm glad Tracy chose this piece because it's one of Swindon Museum and Art Gallery's most recent acquisitions, as it's one of three gifted by the Contemporary Art Society in 2017. And it's a really interesting series of works to have in the collection and we're really fortunate because Monster Chetwind is one of the UK's leading performance artists. Her wonderful carnivalesque work fuses popular culture and classical references and embraces a purposefully amateurish aesthetic. The result, as Tracy alluded to, is playful, humorous and spontaneous. And in 2012, Chetwind became the first performance artist ever to be nominated for the Turner Prize. Swindon's Cat People collages represent a new strand of her work, which, as in her performance art, blurs the boundaries between art forms and combines high and lowbrow imagery with an end result which is witty and subversive. And the imagery in these works draw inspiration from the two Cat People films from 1942 and 1982, which are based on a woman who believed herself to be a descendant of a race of people who turn into cats when sexually aroused or angered. And whilst paying homage to these seminal erotic horror movies, Monster Chetwind pokes fun at the hierarchies of the imagery in art history and commercialism. So in Cat People Collage number no. 4, a giant cat head wearing an elaborate medieval headdress invades a picturesque Renaissance painting. And the resulting humour, theatricality and spontaneity of the collage makes it a direct descendant of her performance work. The second work I want to discuss today is Descent of the Bull's Head by Maggie Hamling, which was chosen by our Art on Tour learning officer, Max. Maggie Hamling is a really prolific and talented contemporary painter who is often regarded as a little bit of a maverick because she can't be categorised within any particular group or movement. Her work is sometimes controversial and sometimes confrontational, but always very real and profound, because Hamling believes that painting should always be about life and death, and much of what she does explores the human condition. So it's really interesting that one of the reasons Max chose this particular work is because there's a juxtaposition between power and fragility here. Hamling first saw a bullfight in 1977 in Madrid, and it had a great impact on her, The subject matter, to paraphrase her own words, bubbled away quietly inside her until she decided to pursue it properly. So in 1985 she went to Barcelona to watch bullfighting again and was struck by the idea that the bull enters the ring proud, powerful and free, but during the course of the short fight is weakened and humiliated. So the painting depicts four stages of the bull transforming from a powerful animal to being tortured, struck and eventually falling to the ground. It's not a particularly cheerful scene, but of course that would miss the point, as the focus is on the brutish side of human nature. Another thing that Mags appreciates about the painting is its great dynamism. The fact that Hamling has chosen to paint the four stages of the falling bull makes it all the more poignant as it makes us, the viewer, party to its destruction. Finally, before we move on, 
I just want to mention that part of what I love about this painting, and indeed much of Hamling's work, is the way it is painted. You might not be able to fully take this in through a digital image, but her use of paint is so incredibly expressive that it almost looks like it's alive and writhing around on the surface of the canvas. And it really helps us to feel this suspended moment between life and death. Our next painting was chosen by our marketing events and premises manager, Nikki. And this one's interesting because it's a local scene from the collection. George Reason's House with a Yellow Door was painted in 1967 and it shows a facade of a building in Swindon's Old Town. And Nikki chose this because it reminds her of her childhood when she used to walk past the building with her family and how much she loved it when she first saw the painting in the collection. Amazingly, the building itself hasn't changed that much, and certainly much of the architectural detail is the same, including the decorative columns, the rounded arch above the door, the mouldings above the windows, the raw iron banister, and of course the door itself, though today it is black instead of yellow. And it's a lovely scene to be able to reminisce over, as Reason has captured it as if on a bright day, with the sun hitting the stone, the steps and the railings. Being local myself, I can see how this image brings back pleasant memories of family walks in Old Town on a crisp, clear day. Our next piece is David Tyndall's Teasel Plant, 21 Warwick Crescent W2, London, from 1955. It was chosen by our museum assistant, Jo, and I want to kick this one off by reading out what she wrote about the piece, because it really sums up the work beautifully. Quote, I can remember the first time I saw this painting, and it stopped me in my tracks. The combination of subdued palettes, the contrast of textured teasel with the geometric architectural details, and the rendering of the shadow just does it for me. There's something utterly complete about it, and the title's bold cataloguing of location gives me the sense that it is a record of the artist in a particular place." Unquote. I want to pick up on that last point because the location of the painting is very specific, and as a realist painter, Tyndall found his subject matter within his everyday surroundings. And that could be a coat hanging on a hook, a simple still life on a creased white tablecloth, or indeed a teasel plant casting a shadow on a wall. This piece shows a teasel plant leaning against a window at night from the inside of his studio in Paddington by Regent's Canal. And the location is quite significant in itself because it was in the same district as numerous other notable artists working in London at the time, including John Minton and Lucian Freud. So it seems there was a very interesting artistic culture going on there. I'm happy that Jo chose this work because it made me look at it a little more closely than I have before. And I realized there's a lot more to it than I initially thought. I actually spent a lot of time thinking that this was painted from the outside, but in fact it was painted from the inside of Tyndall Studio. And now that I know this, I can see that on closer inspection, the dark area along the bottom third of the painting represents diagonal floorboards, and that the window is in fact looking out into the night. But it was the teasel plant being inside that threw me, and this odd inside-outside dynamic makes the piece even more thought-provoking and I'd be interested to know whether others have had the same experience of viewing this as an outdoor scene. Either way, it seems there is more to this painting than initially meets the eye. Another great suggestion came from our museum assistant, Olivia, who chose Robert Bevan's A London Church. Bevan was a founding member of the important yet short-lived Camden Town Group, which included prominent artists such as Walter Sickert, Duncan Grant and Augustus John. They focused on portraying the realities of urban life and their images of pre-war London are important within art history and history in general. Bevan was also involved in the Camden Town Group's expansion into the London Group in 1913, which still exhibits today. A London church, which was painted in 1922-23, shows the Church of St John the Evangelist down Waterloo Road in London, seen through a railway arch and demonstrates Bevan's proficiency for depicting architectural detail. The drawing was produced in preparation for a painting of the same subject. A quick Google search will bring up images of the final work, and we can see that, though the painting is more vibrant, the drawing shows a careful study of architectural detail, and also tonal contrasts of light and dark, particularly in the church's facade and the shadow cast on the road by the archway. 
I'll finish this one by reading out Olivia's observations of the work, which I think really help us understand what Bevan was trying to do. Quote, It's a true example of Bevan's ability to capture a wonderfully atmospheric London scene. The framing of the image through a railway arch draws us in and makes us feel like we're actually standing there on Waterloo Road. There are also a couple of cats fighting on a doorstep, which adds a touch of realism to the bottom left of the sketch. Unquote. The final work for today's Art Snap was chosen by our museum assistant Colette, and it shows another reasonably local scene called Cricklade Landscape by Edward J. Batar. Sadly, I have very little information on the artwork or the artist, apart from the fact that Batar lived from 1873 to 1943. A little investigating revealed that another work in Cricklade Museum was painted in 1920, and there are a few at Cricklade Town Hall from the late 1930s and circa 1940, all of them showing Cricklade, so it certainly seems that Batar was local to the area for some time. And despite the fact that we don't know much about this work, I'm glad that Colette mentioned it, not only because the location means a lot to her, but also because it seems that Batar had a connection to Cricklade just like she does. Plus, it's a really charming piece which gives us an incredible impression of shifting light and changing weather. On the one hand, the landscape is lit by a dazzling light, but on the other, dark clouds are looming and wind blows the trees which are beautifully painted with small expressive brushstrokes. The lone woman at the front of the scene, to whom we're drawn by her red shawl, could be using her umbrella to shelter from the bright sunshine or the incoming rain. And it's certainly a great impression of the changeable weather we're used to experiencing here in Britain, particularly this time of year. I'll end now by saying thank you for listening to this longer art snap. I hope you enjoyed hearing about some of the artworks particularly loved by members of staff at Swindon Museum and Art Gallery. And if there's a piece of work in Swindon's collection which you'd like us to focus on, please do let us know by commenting under this video or getting in touch via Facebook, Instagram or the Art On Tour blog. Until next time, stay safe and stay well.